So now let's discuss why you would need to measure suspensions as they are prepared and without dilution. What is so important? In the schematic on the left hand side, the header is labelled initial contact. What this refers to is any suspension as it is made or formulated. And what is shown is a representation of the particles in that suspension. The particles themselves are red and the blue dots symbolise the surface chemical nature. In practice, this could be the fundamental function groups or something absorbed on the surface. On the right hand side is the same suspension in which a defined chemical equilibrium has been established between the particles and the liquid. What it means is that any species that can potentially desorb or dissolve or dissociate does so to the limits or capacity of the available liquid phase. The greater the particle concentration, the less will be the volume of free liquid available, which means that the solubility limit for surface species will be exceeded, inhibiting any further desorption, dissolution, etc. So in concentrated suspensions, the equilibrium is always shifted towards the surface, and the little icon at the bottom represents the surface probed by any characterization technique. As we see in the next slide and this schematic, on the left hand side, the initial contact in a dilute suspension looks very similar as that seen in the previous slide, except now there are fewer particles. However, once this system reaches its equilibrium state, it is completely different because the total volume of available liquid is much larger. This then allows more surface species to dissolve, dissociate, etc. Their equilibrium is now shifted towards the solution. And the more dilute the suspension, the greater will be the shift. At the extreme, you can end up with a suspension where the surface probed is now represented by the little icon at the bottom, a surface that has no blue dots. This is then completely different from that existing in the concentrated suspension. The important point to take away is that dilution is never an innocuous process and the consequence is that you will get a value from whatever characterization technique used that is not then representative of the concentrated suspension and so may not translate into a useful performance metric. However, I do not mean to imply that you cannot dilute any suspension. There are ways to minimize the shift in chemical equilibrium but it is beyond the subject of this webinar. So let's look at how NMR works. How does the methodology work? Hydrogen atoms in liquids behave a bit like little magnets. And so in this schematic, we show each liquid molecule, the blue ellipses with a north and a south. In the absence of an applied magnetic field, the orientation of these proton magnets are random. And so the net magnetic field is, of course, zero. When we place a sample contained in an NMR tube into the cassette assembly of the acorn area, it is concentric within an RF coil that is located between two permanent magnets, shown by the green disks in the schematic at left and the red disks in the schematic on the right that provide a static magnetic field B sub zero. All the liquid proton magnets, the blue ellipses, now align in the direction of this static magnetic field, a process that occurs rapidly in a few seconds. If we apply an RF pulse at an appropriate frequency and duration, to the RF coil, a temporary magnetic field, B sub 1, is produced, and this is superimposed over the original static magnetic field. The proton magnets now rotate and realign with this new field that, in the acorn area, is 90 degrees to the original static field, a process that takes a few microseconds. When the RF pulse is switched off, B sub 1 is removed, and so the proton magnets relax and rotate back 
to their original orientation within B sub zero. Now a moving magnet in an RF coil produces a decaying voltage, which is an exponential shape as shown in the graph at bottom right, where the blue line is the fit to the experimental data points, red dots. From this exponential decay, we can obtain a characteristic relaxation time for the liquid.